and solitary figure, a rebel, an untiring pamphleteer and orator who belonged to a period of proletarian meetings in austere halls with bare wooden floors. His own life was austere too. He never smoked, never drank alcohol, and in later years quite literally never went to bed, sleeping in an armchair. He was a socialist, an anarchist, an individualist, whose roots lay in Victorian radicalism and free thought. John Caldwell, a sailor, met Guy Aldred in Glasgow in the 30s, then for 30 years was his closest comrade. His message is, well, in a nutshell, man shall not live by bread alone, that there is more than a message of anarchism and socialism and mere materialism. But Aldred is remembered above all for his opposition to war. He was not a pacifist as such. One of his followers remarked that he wasn't opposed to the violence of the human spirit, only to violence promoted by the state. Victor Rose worked as a hairdresser in London and subscribed to Aldred's anti-war journals. I tried to teach other people the futility of the whole business, you know. It's got ingrained right in the damn system, I suppose. Well, I suppose it is Guy Aldred's input. War, 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 war. A man never learns to decide not to go to war. It's a waste of time. Guy Aldred was born in a poor area of London in the 1880s, but made his home in Scotland's bigger city for more than 40 years until his death in 1963. He became a figure of note in Glasgow, attracting the admiration not simply of a small band of working-class supporters, but of young men like Keith Bovey, now a lawyer and prominent Scottish nationalist. All the blame for his not being a more prominent politician is to be laid at the door of politics and not at Guy's door. He wouldn't compromise. I can't accept that somebody who went to prison for Indian independence 40 or 42 years before it came about was not a, a good politician, or that he didn't have positive ideals as distinct from only <laughs> being a gin. Indeed, Aldred's youthful political peregrinations are reflected in the bizarre title of his first autobiography, and how many people turned to autobiography at the tender age of 21. It was called from Anglican boy preacher to anarchist socialist impossibilist. He moved through movements and ideas at a rapid rate. His imprisonment over Indian nationalism followed a famous free speech trial. Then, during the First World War, he was repeatedly court-martialed and jailed for refusing to do military service. It was after the war that Aldred settled in Glasgow, attracted perhaps by Clydeside's left-wing or red reputation. And there he resumed his pamphleteering and started speaking in the parks. The industrialist Sir Monty Finiston, then still at school, used to stop and listen. I always thought his name shouldn't have been Aldred, it should be Aldred, because he was a communist at heart, really. He really was a tremendous man. And although I didn't understand his point of view, he was very rational. I mean, he was a very rational man indeed. I think what he said, he'd learned by heart, but, 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 but he said it very well. And he always had an audience, because people liked listening to him. I don't know that they took any notice of him, but they liked listening to him. And for the young Monty Finiston, the man was even more remarkable than the message. I remember I was very impressed by him for several reasons. I mean, first of all, he was the only man who wore knickerbockers that I ever met. He was also, secondly, the only man I ever knew who toted his mistress around. She wasn't married to him. <laughs> she was a very good-looking woman, and the first man I'd ever met who had a mistress. But it was those baggy trousers tucked into the top of his socks which, as Keith Bovey recalls, earned Guy the nickname of the Knickerbockered Anarchist. I mean, I mean, nobody wore knickerbockers in the 1940s. In the 1930s, they may have worn plus fours, but they didn't wear knickerbockers in my recollection. But Guy always wore knickerbockers. Also, he was a very big man, portly. He spoke with a Cockney accent, which marked him out in Glasgow, of course. He had a very loud voice, and altogether he was a larger-than-life figure. The class war remains a fact because it exists in no man's mind. It arises out of economic conditions. This recording, made in the closing months of Aldred's life when he was too ill to address meetings in person, doesn't do him full justice, but it gives some idea of his style. ...represents the trend towards socialism. It is that that we have to serve and bring about. The phrase, all for the cause, sums Aldred up. He was an obsessive but his granddaughter, Annesley McCurdy, delighted in campaigning with him around Glasgow. How he campaigned, I, I mean, I was only little. It was just fun to me. I loved being out with him. 
and the people coming round and talking to him and I mean he could talk and I mean he loved to get the hecklers um, I mean he could really deal with them <laughs> they, I don't think they ever got the better of him when he was speaking in Glasgow Green once it was getting dark and a crowd of rough characters came to the meeting and Guy was denouncing the Communist Party for their hospital attitude to Moscow, denouncing them thoroughly. And these toughs shouted, you'll never come down here and say that. And Guy just paused, looked at them, and slowly came down the steps from his platform and walked right towards them, right through them, twirled in the middle of them, walked back again up his platform and says, as I was saying, and started. But he was living a life of almost monastic simplicity. He relied on sales of his propaganda and donations from well-wishers. Victor Rose got a shock when he visited Aldred's home in a working-class district of Glasgow. He was living in the Gobbles, a poverty-stricken life. He was obviously dressed in other men's clothes. From my point of view, it was a rather pitiful sort of situation. That The food on the table was very sparse. And as a matter of fact, I don't think there was anything else for him to eat. But he was a soft-spoken man, and had rather soft type of eyes, and so very persuasive in his manner. Aldred's politics are not easy to capture in a couple of sentences. He described himself as an anti-parliamentary communist, but stood unsuccessfully for Parliament on several occasions, and had no time for the straitjacket of the Communist Party. He was an anarchist, yet he quarrelled with almost every other anarchist of note. Keith Bovey says Aldred could never play second string. I think he probably sometimes was just so extremely uh, particular on, on fine points that in a way he couldn't get on with anybody. Uh, he, he was constantly having to start his own movements because he had <laughs> exhausted his patience with the, mm, the reprobates and the movements he was in. When the Spanish Civil War broke out in 1936, Aldred probably had fewer than 50 active followers in Glasgow though his papers and pamphlets sold in their thousands. John Caldwell took responsibility for organising Aldred's propaganda work. A typical day was for me to get up and eat my breakfast of two halfpenny rolls and then go down to a guy, find that he was already out of bed. And then I would go down to his little office which he had in Queen Street. This was just a room with head down and had no electric light or heating in it. I would get down there and hold the fort while a guy would sit down and write usually articles on the Spanish troubles and then we would set out for our propaganda mission for the evening. Glasgow at that time was just alive with meetings and sometimes in the fringes of meetings you'd have little disputes between the anarchists and the members of the Communist Party. We were very conscious, more conscious in those days of this international situation than we were of our own situation at home. Although Aldred and his followers supported the Spanish left in their fight against Franco, they refused to take any part in the wider conflagration that soon engulfed Europe. Victor Rose says they held Britain's rulers in no higher regard than they held Britain's enemies. No way was we going to support either them or fascism, because we detested fascism and everything that it stood for. But you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you take up an attitude where you're opposed to war, and then uh, at the first rattle of the sabre, you forget your socialism. And I couldn't forget my socialism. I went and stood for what I stood for. And since uh, I've been possessed with that idea, for years and years and years, you can't expect me suddenly to change over and put on a uniform and go and fight for King and Country, which I didn't believe in at all. Victor Rose not only refused to fight for King and Country, he wouldn't even dig potatoes to help the war effort. He spent 15 months in prison. Guy Aldred was too old to be conscripted and so was spared another war in jail. But he helped other conscientious objectors to present their case to be exempted from military service. One of his collaborators was Gordon Stott, now Lord Stott, who in later years became Scotland's most senior law officer. He appeared for them in the Glasgow Tribunal, in the local tribunal, and then if they failed there, he sent them through to me and I appeared for them in the appeal tribunal. He saw them and arranged them and helped them and advised them as to what sort of case they had. I think he did quite a lot. I'm sure he did for individuals. A lot of them said to me that they were very grateful to Aldred for the sort of work he did for them in Glasgow. After the war, Aldred was no longer quite such a celebrated figure, but the pamphlets and papers still appeared, 
and there was also a shop and printing press in the centre of Glasgow, which is where Keith Bovey first encountered Aldred. Well, he wanted anybody who would to go in and talk to him, and the neighbourhood kids went in and talked to them, and he patted them on the head and gave them halfpennies or sweeties or something or another like that. So people did go in and use it as an advice centre, what today would be a legal advice centre. Of course, it was populous, that area of the city centre in those days, populated by poor people, and they went in and he helped them. And if you did just once pluck up courage to go in, then you got a paper or a pamphlet and you got an invitation back. And uh, he would say, oh, it's Comrade Bovey, come in. He always called me Comrade Bovey. You had a wonderful welcome every time you went. Another who patronised what she remembers as a small, dingy shop was Maria Fife, now a Labour Member of Parliament. It was just an absolute gold mine of interesting little pamphlets and booklets, some of which I still have in the house. I've been unable to uh, let go of them. But the political message of Guy Aldred's pamphlets was not so well received. I didn't take to them. You know, I was reading widely uh, among all the writers in the Labour movement, and it didn't grab me. I, I felt some of his own egotism came through the writings, and... I could also see that since he had so signally failed to gather any significant movement around him, that clearly he had to be going wrong somewhere. In the late 50s, Aldred had just a handful of followers. His journal, which once sold in tens of thousands, was reduced to a circulation of perhaps 2,000. Donald Dewar, Labour's Scottish Affairs spokesman in Parliament, recalls a rather sad and bedraggled figure. Guy Aldred was a very familiar name. I suppose that might be some sort of um, a tribute to the past, but uh, the present had faded very badly by then. Certainly much a figure in decline, and um, certainly not in mainstream Glasgow politics in any sense. By the time I came along, he, he perhaps had a certain resonance as a man who had a certain courage, because although clearly every tide was running away and he'd been left stranded, he still, kind of a certain magnificence, maintained his rather unlikely political position. Was Aldred dismayed that a life's labour had brought his vision of socialism no nearer? John Caldwell. He would not be depressed by that. And when once when I, attacked, I approached him on that, he says to me, you don't believe in revolution because of how they feel, how they think, how they act. You believe in revolution because of how you feel within yourself. You are a revolutionary. You feel this way. What other people feel does not matter. It's tempting to regard Guy Aldred simply as a historical curiosity, a 19th century eccentric who outlived his era. Yet Keith Bovey sees him rather as a courageous and inspiring figure. The very fact that you're speaking to me 25 years later is, I think, at least indicative, if not eloquent, of the fact that he did sow seeds. All over Glasgow you can find that these seeds are still there and people... It may be just idealism, but if we can pass on some idealism, those of us who admired Guy and caught a little of it, then that may not be bad.